Welcome to the Northwest Hospitality Leadership Podcast, the truth about employee engagement. In the interview that launched this podcast, Washington Hospitality Association President and CEO Anthony Antone discusses the book, The Truth About Employee Engagement with Chris Jensen of The Table Group. This episode is sponsored by U.S. Bank. Click the link below if you would like to learn more about our credit card processing program. So let's get to it. Uh, Two months ago on the podcast that we had about the workforce shortage, I walked through all the reasons on the workforce shortage. And I got a tremendous response from many of you operators and, and, and many of the GMs of that was great. We didn't understand where the workforce was shorting, coming from. We didn't understand the ideas we have to go through. Thank you so much for that one. Um, and Lisa, if you wanna put in the link to that past podcast somewhere as we go, if you haven't had a chance to listen to it, and Lex, I think it's one of our most listened to podcasts we've had. Um, but I also got a big pushback from the HR professionals in our industry. So those companies that do have an HR director or others called me or texted me or emailed me and said, you missed a big one. And that is the perception of our industry's culture to those under 30. And that when they're interviewing people and they're talking to people, uh, their perception of what our culture is like in our industry um, doesn't match our own view. And that is preventing people from even starting the idea of going through this process. Uh, interestingly enough, a week later, I met with all the work source directors um, who are the people in charge by the state for getting and finding people jobs, both in and out of the unemployment system. And they came to me and said, you have a problem. And that's this under 30 crowd. They're no longer attracted to your industry the way they used to be. And, and it's a culture and other perceptions about opportunities. So I've been trying to figure out how we talk about culture. And I started talking to a lot of the individual HR directors. And interestingly, they each had kind of the same list for me of this isn't brain surgery. Um, this is something you just need to do. And in talking to, I think the total number was 12 HR directors. I'm like, well, what would you do if we had to fix our industry culture? Um, their things were make time to be human and connect with your people as humans. And that sounds silly, but I'm like, I feel like I've heard something like that before. Um, have a great communication system and make sure your people know what's going on in the company. Um, lay out a future. And uh, uh, lastly, um, uh, let them know how they bring value and that these jobs matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was walking through, I'm like, I have heard three of these time and time again, where have I heard this? And I'm like, I know where I heard this. Patrick Lencioni's book, The Truth About Employee Engagement. Um, and I'm like, we're hearing from our HR directors, we need to do exactly three of the five things that, uh, uh, or three of these things are mentioned in this book. So I called Chris and Chris, I'm so thankful you're here today. We're facing a true industry crisis. We're short 73,000 workers in Washington mm. for our restaurants and our hotels. Um, and we uh, are trying to figure out how to create a competitive advantage by having a culture be one that attracts and keeps people. Even if you get offered a quarter more an hour, you, you, you still like this place is so fun and I have such a connection here. Talk to me about the truth of employee engagement and why, why the table group put this book forward. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's so timely. This has been, I think, as you mentioned, I think culture and is the company I work for a really great place to work really is the conversation. And, you know, we at the table group, we focus on what we call organizational health for any organization to succeed. They have to be smart and healthy. And so many organizations don't focus on the health of their organization. And really what health is about is do I work at a place that, that um, helps me feel connected and engaged at work? And, and there's a lot of ways in which an organization needs to focus on being healthy. There's teamwork and leadership and all of that. But one of the most important is how do you help your individual employees feel connected to what we're doing at work so that they understand that when they show up to work, they're a part of something that matters, that's using their gifts and talents in order to make a difference. And one of the challenges, particularly on the West Coast, and maybe in particular in, in your area in Washington, I'm, I'm just a little bit down the street in Portland. And um, when you're in an environment with a lot of big businesses that are offering a lot of, um, 
a lot of perks, smaller organizations like our local restaurants really find it difficult to compete as an employer. And so when I can't compete with perks, what's my alternative? And I think this is where your point around culture, this is where culture matters because, you know, we have this unique perspective of getting to see big and small companies and people leave big companies, even with big paychecks and perks, because it's a miserable place to work. And, and in fact, the truth about employee engagement, I don't know if you know this, but when Pat Fos first wrote the book, the original title was three signs of a miserable job. And uh, you and I had talked earlier, Anthony, about how you like to change the names of our negative books into something more positive. You like to talk about the five functions of a team, not the five dysfunctions of a team. Well, this is one of those book titles that backfired on us. So originally it was three signs of a miserable job. Everyone loved the book connected with it, but nobody wanted to have that book up at work because the title was too, too poignant. But the reality is, is there are things that every leader and manager can do that has a immediate and real impact on the experience of employees. And one of the crazy things is it's free. It doesn't cost an organization or a leader anything to do these things. And it actually has a real effect on the experience our employees have in the culture of the, of, you know, in your case, the restaurant or the industry. Um, and so it's something we can do right away. And I was, I was telling you uh, when you and I talked this anecdote that I just happened to have talked with a local school here in Portland. Do you remember uh, what, me telling you? What are, the, what are the odds that that would happen? What are the odds of this? Yeah. I, I, I know. Go ahead and tell the story. Yeah, I, was, I had just been toured. It was this alternative high school and it was focused on trade education. Well, one of the things the leaders of the school wanted to do was build this really state-of-the-art kitchen for young students to learn uh, essentially how to go into the industry. And the folks who were funding this said this was a big mistake. It was a half a million dollar kitchen. And they said, do not build a kitchen in your school. Nobody wants to go in the industry. It's a miserable place to go. There's nowhere to go when you're in it. And then you and I jump on the phone and you say, this is the reputation of the industry. And I thought this is, you know, I'm in Portland. We're you know, similar to the Seattle area, we're the home of restaurants. We love our local small restaurants. And, uh, and so it surprised me to hear somebody from the industry say that. And I thought, well, gosh, that has to change. And, and this, what we're talking about today, these are three things that affect the culture in a restaurant or in whatever the hotel or whatever the industry is that you're in related to hospitality. These three things are things you could do right away and it will have a real impact. And it does affect, doesn't matter how much money you make, people will leave their jobs if they feel like any one of these three things are, are um, a part of their experience. The basic of the book starts off with teaching this in a restaurant. In a restaurant. Mm -hmm. it, it's a about restaurant. a small pizza place <laughs> who, who has miserable employees and can't get done accurately right. in spite right. of a nice good-hearted owner uh, and so i was like well if there's ever a book that restaurateurs are going to read and feel good about it, like this one's actually based on a pizza place lex which ought to make you feel at home being the former pizza guy <laughs> and then i flipped over the cover of the book and the coo of taco bell and uh um the chief learning officer for general mills and the vice senior vice president for hilton which is all our industry are all saying right. this is a must read Right. So, so as you're listening and you're like, to hell with culture, I just need to get to the bottom line and push people. This does matter. And so kind yeah. of get out of your comfort zone a little bit. And, and with that, let's start going into that. Let's talk about these three things um, that are simple things that we can start working on that don't cost us anything. Chris, yeah. what would be a good one to start with? Well, and I think the, the fear of touchy feely is a good point because the first point is, is not really touchy feely at all. And it's the first sign that your employees are probably miserable at work is that they're experiencing anonymity. And so as leaders, and what that means is if our people come to work every day and they don't feel known by their manager and they experience anonymity, they're going to feel miserable at work. And so one of the first things we can do as leaders or managers or operators in our business is help our people feel known. Uh, make sure we know who they are, what are the big rocks in their life, the big challenges they're facing. This is not touchy-feely. This is not about getting into kind of their inner, 
you know, their inner child issues, but it's just getting to know them as a, as a person. You know, what are their priorities? What's important to them? Who they are? What are their challenges? This is simple. It's not that complicated, but it makes a big difference when people show up to work and feel like the people I work with and the people I work for, they know who I am and they actually take an interest in me. That has a real effect. When people come to work and they, they believe no one cares that they showed up, they will leave. They will leave or they'll give minimal effort and they won't feel apart. But it's hard to leave a place when you feel, it's kind of the, uh, you remember that old show, Cheers? Yes. You know, it's hard to leave a place when everybody knows your name, right? To do a, an old callback. And so I think that's a big deal. Uh, that's a big deal. And, and so you know, I, I see it play out in, in some of the places that have higher retention. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Bob Donigan's from Ivers. Ivers is a, a regional chain. Mm -hmm. and, and you walk through one of the stores with, uh, with Bob and, uh, and he will be talking to every, from the cook to the host and he knows their name. He'll ask them a question. Right. They say, Mr. D, great to see you. How's the garden? For, 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 I don't know how many employees they have. I'll say roughly 800 employees. I really don't know if that's the number. Right. I'll bet he knows most of their names and two or three things about him. And, and you can see when they say hi, Mr. D back and start asking him, they care about him. They care. Yeah. Which is so cool to watch it play out live. So it's doable um, in, in pushing ourselves there. Yeah. And it, and it affects those of us who are, who patronize these restaurants or these places, because we can all feel as customers when the environment, when the employees feel known and they feel like they're a part of something, they actually make me feel that way. And I, my favorite restaurants are the ones when I walk in, I feel like they know my name. They say, Hey, Chris, welcome back. And I love that. That's a sign that something's going right behind the scenes between the operators and the employees that it's more than just clock in, clock out and get your job done. So that's the first sign. We have to overcome anonymity. Our employees need to feel known by their manager. That's not touchy feely. That's just about pausing and just asking some questions to get to know who they are and what's important to them. That's the first one. And, and that's real simple to start with simple questions and, and make an icon. I mean, it's, it's like hospitality to your guests, but hospitality to your, your team. Exactly. Exactly. That's be, a great way to put it. What would be the second one? Cause yeah, the second, the second one is, is uh, equally important. And this is helping your employees overcome uh, your, the feeling of irrelevance, right? A lot of, and this is like back of the house, what does my job have to do with the front of the house? Maybe if I work in the front I am in and I'm interacting with customers and, and the people, I, I might have more clear understanding of how my job matters and who I impact. But when employees come to work and they feel like their job doesn't matter that much, there's no relevance to their work, no one cares if they do well, that's, that's going to lead to misery. But if you want your people to come to work and feel like, the gifts and talents and my passion, especially I think in the industry, my passion for service or um, food, if this is having an impact on others, that's going to make a big difference. And so when your employees don't know who their work affects, um, they're going to be more miserable. But when we as leaders and managers and operators, and we could say, here's why it matters so much for you to do a great job it goes a long way to have an effect. This is what one of our, one of the uh, companies we worked with is Chick-fil-A. And if you've ever been in a Chick-fil-A, you've been in a drive-thru. This is one of the things they do really well. All their employees know how they make a difference and what they can do about that. And this is one of the reasons why I think a lot of people love waiting in that line and, you know, getting their chicken sandwich because people are so nice and they talk with their employees about, you know, why it matters and what their job matters and, and that sort of thing. Actually, this remind a quick a quick anecdote. When the when this book was written, one of the things Pat was paid attention to was how uh, in airport restaurants how miserable some of the some of these staff seemed. They seemed like they hated their job. And he thought this is a tragedy. Here's people serving people food when they're highly stressed. If there was ever an easier way for an operator to make an employee feel like, hey, you're going to work here for a couple of hours. You're going to be interacting with customers who are in a hurry, stressed, tired, and worried. You get 30 seconds to maybe make a difference in somebody's life. That would be a big deal. And yet a lot of managers don't slow down to even make a small little connection like that. And people feel miserable.
Uh, and, and again, I, I, I so believe in it. And again, this comes down to real simple questions of right. um, how did you make a difference today? Right, or, exactly. Or t- tell me about something that went great yesterday. That's right. That's these right. Are, these are free, easy questions that that build. They build towards something that creates. Family. And they have a real effect. The last one, if I could jump to the last one, absolutely, because this one is probably one of the most difficult. Is um, how do I help my people overcome? And we made up this word in measurement. I don't know how to measure my own progress or whether or not I'm doing a good job. The definition of success for me as an employee is totally left up to the subjective opinion of my manager. And so when I don't feel like I'm in control of my own progress and I don't have a way to evaluate whether or not I did a great job at the end of the day, I'm going to leave having more questions about whether I did well than feeling confident that I did a great job at work. And so as leaders, as, as operators, we need to help our people be clear on how do you know you've succeeded in your job? whether or not I'm present. And I think we don't do a great job clarifying what success looks like. And so employees are left kind of filling in the gap. My, my two oldest children, they're teenagers. They just got their first job at a, as food servers at a senior care facility. And this is one of the things the operators of this facility have done great. They, the first two weeks of their onboarding was all focused on helping them understand what success looks like. And it's silly things like, make sure all the little jams on the tables are always full. When they get one, pay attention. And if it's always full, you know, you're doing great. And make sure you smile every time you see one of our, um, you know, one of the residents, um, make sure you're smiling and say their name. And so there's just simple things that help my kids as, you know, 15 and 17 year old teenagers leave. And when I ask them when they come home, how was work? They know. Great. I only got three orders wrong. And, but I did A, B, and C and i and they have loved it this summer. And I think this is one of those simple things that we typically just say, you know, go behind in the kitchen and just clock in, clock out, and don't screw up. And we wonder why people feel miserable. So in measurement, giving people control of how they assess and evaluate their own progress at work, this is key. I, I, and I, I'm a huge fan. One of my best mentors I've, I've had, I've, had, I've been blessed to have several mentors. But Mark Zanner, who was the old CEO of uh, Great Western Dining, mm. just drilled in my head, everything is measurable. Right. Everything. Right. And then I would attend their leadership team meetings and he'd be like, how would you know that? And, and then, right. like, then measure it. Right. right. And the book gives a great example. If you read the book, it could be as simple as how many people did you make smile today? Exactly. Exactly. What a cool measurement is that is if you're in the window, you don't have any control over the food right? You don't have any control of how many cars are pulling up. But what you do have control of is, is that interaction with the guest. Right. And so in the book, you're like, I want to, I want to hear how many people you made smile today. And then they would talk about that. I'm like, this is doable. This is, these it's are not, smart, easy questions to move forward with. That's right. It's not only doable, this cost an operator $0 to do these three things. And here's the thing. I've seen people making six and seven figure incomes leave organizations because they're not getting these three things. They have big paychecks, they've got tons of perks, and they're leaving companies because they feel miserable at work because they don't feel, they feel anonymous, they feel irrelevant, and they have no way of evaluating their own progress or their own future. I'm going to get back to the why. And then Lex, I'd love for you to put your app writer hat on and, and, and ask us a little bit about this. But the why I'm covering this today is we're in a, in a workforce shortage. And many of you are probably short 20 to 30% of your workforce. But I am discovering in conversations, not everyone is. And, and the difference a lot that is making it for a lot of people, not everyone, is culture. And will your employees be advocates to say, this place is awesome. It's like family. Come work here. And if your employees won't recruit from you and won't bring you great talent and, and people who are probably similar to them, um, you probably need to ask why, and we're giving you three questions to start implementing to turn your employees into apostles to get your workforce back, making them better, but making sure they don't leave and they have a stake in the game. And Chris, if I have it wrong, these questions are really, how are you doing? Connecting to them on a local level. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me about what you did to make a difference, making them know that their job is relevant. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then three, 
making sure they understand how they know that, how they know right. that they've had success and how they know to judge a good day. Exactly. Lex, you and I've been through this. You were, when you and I first started working together, you were one of the gruffer operators who let's just get crap done and stuff and, 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 uh, and put on your old operator hat. I mean, you've, you've developed a lot. I'm not criticizing you today, but I remember you talking about the pizza business and how direct you had to be. When you hear Chris and I talking about this, what's your reaction and what questions do you have? Well, I guess my question is um, a lot of what you talk about seem to be appropriate to be attached to a, a greater purpose, uh, uh, a BHAG, right? The, the big, hairy, audacious goal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how important is having that higher mission uh, as opposed to just getting so much in sales, but having that BHAG or a greater purpose to, and relaying that to your employees, how much does that factor into all of this? I, it, it's, it's night and day. It makes a big difference. You know, I think as operators, we want to believe we can, people will work for the good of the company. Uh, but when you're the owner operator, it's different. And I come from, you know, a family of every one of my aunt and uncle's own businesses. Employees want to want to know that the reason they're showing up to work is to make a difference in other people's lives, not fill the owner's pocketbooks with more money. Now, we want the business to succeed. That's the reason we run businesses. The question is, is why does that business exist? What's the effect it has on people? And every business should do some good in the world, even a pizza shop. There should be some reason why this business should exist that has a difference. And whether you're, you know, twirling pizzas in the back or at the cash register or delivering, there should be a reason why your job matters on somebody, right? Um, not on a number or a revenue target. Um, numbers are not as motivating as impact on people. People want to know that their life matters and has an effect on others. Right. Thank you. And and then and Lex, I see that a lot in, in in talking to people about their different retention in different stores, right? Right. Same company, in theory, same motive to to grow a larger company. And yet some GMs have the ability to connect on these levels and their retention is family-like uh, and stays. And then the other stores are turning and burning a half their staff every 90 days. Um, and yet. Mm -hmm it comes down to some of these, these personal things. Um, and I keep reminding, that's why hospitality is in our name, right? You see hospitality right there. Um, and like, well, I'm a restaurant. I'm not really hospitality. The memory you create is these memories your employees create. Right. And, and when they get that they're, they're in and they're buying, they're buying in the book talks a little bit while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Chris, if there, if there are any today, mm -hmm. uh, the book takes the initial step of talking about how to do this in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And, the, and this, this little pizza place in, in Tahoe, and then goes on to talk about how they applied it to a regional, um, I believe it was a sporting goods store. Mm -hmm. um, owners are not always on site every day. Um, typically, they're already working a ton of hours, but if they have two stores, they have GMs and shift managers. What are some of the keys you've seen to taking these three questions and having them live beyond the owner? But, but living at the, the shift manager level with the people who really are managing those eyeball to eyeball direct customer uh, team members. employees. Yeah. 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 This is why it's important for us to be very thoughtful about who we promote and how we prepare them for their role. And a lot of times we take an employee and we need somebody to be a shift supervisor or um, a lead and we just promote them and we, and we don't give, we don't clarify for them what their definition of success is. And so, you know, if I'm a frontline employee who's working the cash register, I'm going to have one definition of success. If I'm a supervisor or, um, you know, a team lead, you know, I might have another one. And so as an operator, it's important for me to be able to understand, you know, under the, under the banner of helping overcome immeasurement. What's the definition of success for you as a team lead? And this is, this is part of the culture thing. Culture is not about perks and events and, you know, let's do a team meal together. Culture is about kind of institutionalized behaviors that become our norms of how we function when we're working together. And so as an operator, you want to start institutionalizing these three things into how we work together so that even if I'm not there, 
shift supervisors, team leads, or even peer to peer, they're actually doing these three things with each other. They're asking each other how you're doing. They're pointing out and recognizing when somebody makes a difference. And so you want to institutionalize this in your, um, especially in your promotion process. So when you're promoting somebody into a lead position, you want to explain to them their role and their responsibility as a lead to affecting the, the experience of the frontline employees. The book is there. What, what other resources could people learn more from Chris, if they want to take these ideas and, and go deeper. Yeah. At our website, tablegroup.com, there's actually a link to the book. Uh, there's also uh, free resources there for anybody to just download and use. There's some manager tools uh, related to the truth about employee engagement books specifically. Um, you could buy the book from our website. You could buy it from any major books, bookseller, or, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, or anywhere, any of the online places you can buy the book. Uh, but on our website, tablegroup.com, you can get some kind of free downloadables and tools related to the concepts we've been talking about. It, it's a really good read. And it's about a restaurant. So we should, we should, we should like it. Mm -hmm. And for your hoteliers, the, one of the senior vice presidents of Hilton is saying this is a must read. So it's a uh, crosses both worlds of our membership. Um, I had the honor to work with Alan Mulally uh, when I was uh, the state um, government affairs person for Boeing. Oh, wow. Washington. And um, it amazed me that he took the time to walk the factory floor and he'd run into people and know their names. Yeah. How he did it, I don't know. But I, it always dawned on me when I'm feeling too busy to get to know people, a guy who ran the largest airplane company in the world and was factories in several states took a few hours to walk the floor. And someone, how, one, he had an incredible memory. He's, he's a brilliant that's my other man crush other than Patrick Lynch. <laughs> um, yeah, ours too. Ours too. We love Alan. Uh, but he would be able to walk and say, hi, how are you doing? And remember someone's name and, a, and an element about him that made then the union conversations easier because right. the members didn't want to be anti-Alan. They, right. they, this is a CEO who cared about us. Right. Um, and if he can do that and a guy who's literally getting there. If you read, if you read his book, which is one of my other top three books, American icon, mm -hmm. um, how he turned around Ford, he get there at six 37 in the morning. He's leaving at one or two in the morning. And yet it was important for him enough to take an hour or two to walk the floor. Right. And, or, or go out and see the dealers and get to know people on the personal level. So this stuff. Well, and see, the point of that is it really doesn't matter who you are, how important you are, what your status is, what your title is. What makes employees respect and want to work for leaders and operators is do, do, do the leaders I work for want to know me? And Alan was a great role model for that. He was a great role, role model for all the concepts we've talked about today. This is, these are things that were embedded in how he approached things. He didn't have the book, but I think this is sort of the point of our tools is it's not about our books or our models. It's really, these are common sense leadership tools that you can put into practice that when you do, it has a real effect on people's willingness to work for you, work hard for you, and stay with you. Well, we're approaching the end of our time, Chris. I want a million thank yous. I, I yeah, called you out of the blue. Me. You never met me before, and you were willing to come on and help small operators and Washington hospitality hopefully start to turn our cultures into a competitive advantage for our employees, which yeah. is really my core point. Any closing thoughts before I wrap it up, Chris? No, I think the main thing is these are things all of us can put into practice this afternoon. So any of us who are operating, pausing and just walking in and taking a time to ask your people, you know, how are you doing? How are things going outside of work for you? Just that simple question, even a 30 second and listening to a 30 second answer will cause your employees to leave feeling more connected and engaged and in a competitive environment like we're in right now. If you can't pay top dollar, um, then your culture is what you have. And so you can start doing that right now. I'm going to end on that note. Please try to, we'll do everything we can to provide information. Try to make your culture a competitive advantage. And That's if you right. ask your employees to help recruit and they refuse or are unsuccessful, that probably means you've got some work to do. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Look for our next episode coming in January when we discuss the five temptations of a CEO. Temptation number five, choosing invulnerability over trust. Thanks for listening.